All right, welcome back. Welcome back to what is essentially the brain part two. Um, so I apologize in advance. Obviously, the last lecture was longer than our normal uh, 50 minutes that is allotted for class. That one's a little over an hour. This one's probably going to be somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, but what I'm trying to do here is to squeeze two um, longer lectures, or, or actually three lectures into two, so they end up being a little bit longer, but that gives us a little bit more time to make sure we can do an in-class review uh, next week. So anyway, this is the brain part two. Last time we covered the cerebral hemispheres, and so this time we're going to get on to all the rest of the brain, although we're going to get back into the cerebral hemispheres toward the end when we talk about um, the, some of the, the functional aspects of the brain that are going to involve multiple areas of the brain. So we didn't quite get to this last time, so um, we left off at the diencephalon. And so as you can see on the slide, there are three components to the diencephalon. And what are we talking about here? So obviously this is a uh, mid-sagittal cut of the brain. So you're looking in at the right cerebral hemisphere. Um, and so the, the, uh, sorry, the diencephalon is all of this purple stuff. So the, the structures we're about to talk about now, so you can see here's your thalamus, and then here's your hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus, we won't really get to this because we're not getting into the endocrine system, but the hypothalamus also exerts quite a bit of control over the pituitary gland. And so that's, that's one of the ways that it's going to exert its influence over the autonomic nervous system. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I should probably talk about the thalamus. So we're gonna touch on the thalamus again, when we are later in this talk. So I, I won't spend a ton of time on it now because I want to um, touch on it as part of those larger functional systems here in a little bit. But for now, the thing that I want you to know about the thalamus is that it's the relay station for the brain. And you probably kind of saw that when we left off last time. Remember that the last lecture it left off talking about the basal ganglia and their role in um, allowing or not voluntary movements to occur. And so remember that essentially what happened was we would, from the motor cortex, want to initiate a movement. We'd run that through the basal ganglia, and then that actually has to run back through the thalamus, and then the message gets back to the uh, motor cortex. So the thalamus is a relay center in that way. We relay uh, the vast majority of information uh, through the thalamus that goes to the rest of the brain. So um, it has, and I don't have this picture uh, from the book in the slideshow, but there's a, in the book, one of the diagrams includes a picture of the thalamus where it, it, it's kind of egg-shaped, but it has a bunch of different colors on it. And so what those colors represent are different nuclei in the thalamus. And so nuclei are clusters of cell bodies. And so each nucleus, each of the nuclei, we'll, we'll stay plural, um, is specialized in its function. So each of those is going to project fibers to and receive fibers from a specific region of the cerebral cortex. So for example, with respect to the basal ganglia, you're gonna get, uh, they're gonna receive fibers from, uh, or the thalamus will receive some fibers from the basal ganglia and then relay those back to a specific area in the motor cortex. Um, as another example, one of the nuclei in the thalamus is called the ventral posterolateral lateral nuclei. And so it's going to receive impulses from the general somatic sensory receptors. And so remember that the somatic sensory receptors are ones that are responsible for touch, pressure, and pain. And then it's going to relay those signals onto the somatosensory cortex. And at the somatosensory cortex, that's where we're going to be able to localize that uh, sensation. So it's, it's on uh, the middle of my posterior thigh. So localizing there in the somatosensory cortex. And again, then we have relays to the somatosensory association area that's gonna then tell us what that thing is that's touching me. So when the information gets to the thalamus, we have a crude recognition of that information basically as being either pleasant or unpleasant. And then we get more specifics after we relay that information from the thalamus on into the somatosensory cortex or some of the other uh, sensory and association areas. So the thalamus then, if you know nothing else about it, know it's the relay center of the brain. The hypothalamus, um, if you know nothing else about it, know that it controls the autonomic nervous system. So remember the autonomic nervous system are those uh, automatic or unconscious motor responses that um, help keep us in homeostasis, but also help defend us um, in case we're scared and need to run away, um, or um, if it, they play a role in, as you can see there, 
regulating our hydration status and a number of other things. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll stick with that. Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, so things that the hypothalamus is, is responsible for. So you can see the first one on there is, is physical response to emotions. So I mentioned this before, but the hypothalamus is going to play a role in controlling both, um, you know, the, the parasympathetic, or sorry, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. Remember that sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. And so when we um, get scared and, and are prepared to engage in fight or flight, the hypothalamus is going to control um, our, our physical responses to that. So it, it's going to um, prepare us to run away or prepare us to defend ourselves through um, the release. Uh, it's going to affect the release of different hormones, and that'll help prepare us. Other things on there, um, it's going to regulate body temperature. So the hypothalamus um, has special thermoreceptors that monitor the temperature of your blood. And so if your blood temperature gets too high, it's going to initiate sweating. If your blood temperature gets too low, it's going to initiate shivering. So it plays a really important role in controlling your body temperature. It also uh, plays a role, a key role in your appetite, whether or not you feel like you need to eat. Uh, so it controls that hunger drive. So you can see two hormones on there, cholecystokinin, or the abbreviation for that one is CCK. So cholecystokinin is a hormone that is produced by the cells of the small intestine. So whenever you eat, um, food goes from your stomach, where we basically mash it up, to um, the small intestine, which is where we actually absorb the food. And so if you have um, food that enters the small intestine, it would be called chyme there. Um, but once it enters the small intestine, if there's a really high fat content to it, the cells of the small intestine are going to release this hormone, cholecystokinin. And so when they dump that hormone into the blood, it makes it up to the hypothalamus. And so the hypothalamus then interprets that as, oh, there's a really high fat meal in the intestines. So I've got a lot of calories, so I shouldn't feel, I shouldn't feel hungry anymore. And so that will diminish or, or uh, shut off the hunger drive. And then the opposite is the case with ghrelin. So ghrelin sometimes referred to as the hunger hormone. And so it's actually released by cells in the stomach. So when the stomach is empty, we can release uh, ghrelin or it'll release ghrelin. Same process when that's picked up by the um, hypothalamus, then uh, it's going to increase your hunger drive because it recognizes that, oh, stomach's empty. You should probably fill it with something. Other things um, helps play a role in water balance. So basically the hypothalamus monitors the concentration of the blood. And so if the blood gets too concentrated, that's probably because you lost the plasma volume, you lost the fluid component of the blood. And so in response to that, the hypothalamus wants to hang on to what fluid you have. And so it'll respond by releasing antidiuretic hormone. So that's what ADH stands for, is antidiuretic hormone. And so anti antidiuretic hormone causes the kidneys to retain water and so helps us stay hydrated. Um, as an aside, one of the things you are probably aware, if you consume a lot of alcohol, you end up dehydrated at the end of that process, oftentimes the next morning. And so one of the things that leads to that dehydration is that alcohol tends to suppress antidiuretic hormone production um, and the influence of the hypothalamus. And so you end up then losing too much fluid. And so that's why you end up dehydrated. Also plays a role in sleep and wake. Similarly, um, the epithalamus, the only thing, I won't ask you about the epithalamus, but um, what it does is uh, secretes melatonin, which is a sleep-inducing signal. So both the hypothalamus and the epithalamus play a role in our sleep and wake cycles. So now we're on to the brainstem, which, backing up a slide, so the brainstem is down here. It's all this green stuff, so that's the next thing we're talking about. So there are three components to the brain brainstem. Those are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And so those run in order from superior to inferior. So the midbrain is on top, it's the most superior. The medulla is on bottom, it's the most inferior. So in general, the thing to know about the brainstem is that it controls automatic behaviors that are necessary for survival. So one of the ways it's, it's sometimes described is um, as being your reptile brain. So it, it basically just controls the things um, that you need in order to continue to live. So of note, uh, in the midbrain, there's a couple things of note there. The first is that there's an area of it called the paraaqueductal gray. 
and I won't, I won't actually ask you about this, but the reason I mentioned the paraaqueductal gray is that it's interesting in that it's involved in descending pain control. Um, and so what that is, um, I've actually described it to you before, that is uh, if you, let's say, sprain your ankle in the state championship soccer game or basketball game, whatever it is that you're a fan of. Um, and if you've noticed, uh, if you've injured yourself during a big game, it oftentimes doesn't hurt during the game, but then afterwards when you get showered and cooled off and everything is over, now it hurts. And so there's a few reasons for that. One is that the inflammatory process takes a little while to kick in, but another reason deals with your perception of the pain. So the paraaqueductal gray has the capacity to essentially block pain signals that are coming up and keep them from reaching the brain. So the brain can't process that um, there are pains that that something has happened that's painful. So um, what ends up happening there is that again, so those pain signals are actually uh, getting back to the spinal cord, but they're not making it up to the brain so that the brain can process that information so that the brain can can recognize that as pain or interpret that as pain. The other thing on there with the midbrain is that um, the substantia nigra is actually there. So if that's familiar, that's because we talked about uh, the basal ganglia and those dopamine producing neurons are in the substantia nigra, which is actually technically part of the midbrain. Um, but so there are dopamine producing neurons there in the midbrain that are responsible for, among other things, uh, helping us to control movement. Um, the pons, probably the most noteworthy thing there is that there are several pairs of cranial nerves that originate there, including the trigeminal, abducens, and facial nerves. And so those are nerves that are responsible for things like eye movement and movement of the facial muscles and also sensation of the face. The medulla oblongata is fun to say. Um, and if you've ever seen The Water Boy, so this is a, an outdated movie reference, um, but that's one of the things that the uh, professor in that movie talks about that makes alligators so ornery uh, is something related to their medulla oblongata. Anyway, uh, so medulla oblongata, again, sometimes referred to as your reptile brain. So there's a few things there, and, and I do want you to know these things. Um, one of the important things that happens in the medulla is what's called decussation of the pyramids. What is that? So what that means, um, remember that last time when we talked about the uh, cerebral hemispheres, so we, I talked about how the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. So if I want to contract my left bicep, that uh, pyramidal cell in the primary motor cortex that's going to initiate that signal, that's on the right side of the brain. And so how do we end up with the right side of the brain controlling the left side of the body? And the answer is that those tracks, those axons, switch sides in the medulla. So decussation of the pyramids means that you get a swapping of sides of those uh, of the axons responsible for um, from the right side of the brain to the left. They move over to the left side of the body or the left side of the brain. Those axons move to the right side of the body. So they cross over there in the medulla oblongata. The, the CV center stands for cardiovascular center. So you have several different centers, if you will, several different clusters of neurons in the medulla that are responsible for, in the case of the cardiovascular center, it's responsible for adjusting your heart rate, so increasing your heart rate, um, or for increasing or decreasing your blood pressure. So the cardiovascular center then directs your heart. Now the heart beats on its own, we'll talk about that in 202, or left to its own devices it can, but it operates under the influence of the brain. And so the cardiovascular center um, directs that, directs your heart rate and direct, directs your blood pressure. The respiratory center, same concept, um, directs your breathing rate and depth. Um, so you got neurons there that do that. So one of the things we'll talk about um, to give a spoiler for later in the lecture is about brain swelling. And so when the brain swells, ultimately the reason that you die um, eventually uh, as a result of that swelling is, is you get a compression of the brain stem. And so that then compresses the neurons in the cardiovascular center and the respiratory center. And so those things stop your heart and stop your breathing. And so ultimately that's uh, what leads to death most of the time in uh, cases where there's brain swelling for one reason or another. Other centers or other groups of nuclei in the medulla include centers that regulate vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing. So that's the brain stem. And then the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, the, the most important thing that I want you to know 
is that it helps coordinate movements. And so you can see, I'm sure I stole that wording from the book there, but it provides timing and appropriate patterns of skeletal muscle contraction for smooth coordinated movements. So know that the cerebellum coordinates our movements. So the cerebellum sits essentially under um, the cerebral hemispheres. It sits inferior or below the occipital lobe and then just posterior to the brainstem. And actually you can see that here. So here's your brainstem. Uh, and then this back here is the cerebellum. So it is pretty similar to the cerebral hemispheres in, in a lot of ways, at least structurally. So you can see that there is this outer cortex of gray matter, and then there's this inner layer, not layer really, but an, an inner area of white matter. So remember that the white matter will be axons. So those are tracks, those are bundles of axons that are going somewhere, either they're going up, um, going to the thalamus or they're going down, um, but those are tracks of axons. Um, so you can see there, so it says it has uh, sensory maps, and so you can see there's three little sensory maps here. Um, so different portions of the cerebellum are responsible for monitoring sensation in different parts of the body. So the more medial portion of uh, the cerebellum, so kind of here, so again, so obviously that's your midline, so you can see what I'm about to talk about here. So there's the trunk, and then the trunk is kind of here on either side. So the, the most medial portions of the cerebellum are responsible for um, awareness of trunk position. So, you know, are you leaning over? Are you leaning forward, backwards, etc.? And then the intermediate parts influence the distal parts, including the limbs. So kind of out here, we're controlling the limbs, as you can see. And then the uh, most lateral aspects of it are their job is to integrate or coordinate information from the association areas of the cerebral cortex. Um, so for example, the somatosensory association area, um, and that's gonna help us play a role in planning our movements. So the bottom thing on there, the cerebellar peduncles, peduncles, I don't know, I actually don't know how you pronounce that. I think it's peduncles. Anyway. Um, there's three of those, superior, middle, and inferior, and, and each of those goes to a different part of the brain stem, respectively. So the superior peduncle goes to the midbrain, which, as we'll recall here, is the top part, the most superior part of the brain stem. So the superior peduncle um, from the cerebellum is a tract of axons that goes into the midbrain, and those are going to carry instructions away from the cerebellum to, um, and it goes through the thalamus, but through the thalamus to the motor cortex. And so that's what's gonna help us uh, coordinate our movements is that, uh, and you'll see this on the next slide, but basically the cerebellum is gonna generate a motor plan. Here's how you do what you wanna do. And it's gonna send that plan or send that blueprint through the midbrain, through the thalamus, and then that's gonna synapse with the motor cortex. And then the motor cortex will initiate the movement. So that's the way that the cerebellum helps us coordinate our movements is it basically draws up the plans for here's what you should do. Here's which muscles you should contract. Here's which motor units you're gonna need. So how much force you need. And then here's the timing of those things. So that's the job of the cerebellum. And we know that because when somebody has damage to their cerebellum, they end up with these really awkward movements that are that are fairly uncoordinated and, they're, and the patient tends to be fairly unsure of their movements as well. So they're just not able to generate those motor plans to uh, time muscle contractions, you know, in an orderly sequential fashion. And they have trouble um, deciding how, how the intensity of the contraction is probably the best way to say that. So the superior Peduncle carries information, carries that blueprint to the thalamus, which then gets relayed up to the motor cortex. Then the middle peduncle goes from the cerebellum to the pons, which is that middle part of the brain stem. And so what happens there is, um, actually I just had the wrong direction. Uh, it's gonna carry information from the pons to the cerebellum. So that's incoming, that's afferent, that's sensory information coming into the cerebellum. And that uh, sensory information is going to advise the cerebellum of voluntary motor activities that the motor cortex has initiated. So it basically says, here's what we're doing as far as movement. Um, that information travels then over the middle cerebellar peduncle. So it says, here's what we're, here's what we're doing right now. Here's, here are the motor signals that are going out so that you know whenever you're putting together the blueprint for how we're gonna change things or how we're gonna coordinate things. And then the 
inferior uh, cerebellar peduncle is also sensory. So it's going to convey sensory information to the cerebellum from proprioceptors in the muscles um, and then in vestibular nuclei, which are uh, balanced nuclei. So uh, it then gets sensory information from the body and tells the cerebellum, which that sensory information tells the cerebellum where we are in space, if we're moving, how fast, all that kind of stuff. So essentially what happens is that when we're going to move, um, it's, and it's very similar to what we talked about last time with the basal ganglia. So some of those motor neurons or pyramidal neurons are going to synapse with the uh, cerebellum. So it's going to receive input from the motor cortex, as you can see there. So it basically says, here's what, here's what I'm going to do. And in addition to that, it's getting that sensory information coming back from the proprioceptors through this inferior peduncle. So basically, it's getting the uh, input from the motor cortex that says, here's what we're doing or here's what we're about to do. And then it gets the sensory information from the body via this tract that says, uh, here's where we are in space. So are we moving? Are we not? Are we close to something? Are we not? Um, and so based on that information, it's able to deduce, okay, if I need to um, walk across the room to sharpen my pencil, here's, here's the sequence of muscle contractions. You know, I need to contract uh, hamstrings and glute at the exact same time, but also the quads, and here's the intensity um, in order to en enable me to rise from the chair and then start walking across the room. So again, uh, once it, it combines that intent, I guess, if you will. Once it combines that information that it's going to receive from the motor cortex, here's what we want to do. Again, similar to what we talked about with the basal ganglia. So here's what we want to do. Here's where we are in space. Now we're going to create a plan, and then we're going to send that plan back to the motor cortex so that we can execute that plan. So again, the cerebellum then helps us refine our movements, um, helps us coordinate them. All right, on to the limbic system. So now we're going to be talking about different brain systems that, as you can see, span multiple brain structures. So um, oftentimes, you know, if, if you see something funny, you then get a physical reaction to that. So you see it, you recognize it, and then you the physical reaction that you have is laughter. And so that's going to span, obviously, multiple brain systems. Um, so the limbic system, then, as you can see, is our emotional or visceral brain. Um, so a lot of structures in the brain are going to be involved in emotion, but four of them are especially important. And so of those four, one is the hypothalamus. And so the hypothalamus, again, controls the autonomic nervous system. So it is basically the executor of emotion. So if you're scared, it'll affect, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, etc. So the hypothalamus is going to execute the emotion. The amyg amygdala is the orchestrator of the emotion. And I'll move a picture up here. So your amyg amygdala is down here. Um, so it basically says, here's the emotion that you should feel. And then the striatum plays a role in the formation of habits. So the striatum we talked about, it's part of the basal ganglia, if that sounded familiar to you. And then the prefrontal cortex is going to be involved in evaluating whether a particular emotional response is appropriate to the situation at hand. So the prefrontal cortex, that front part of your brain, we talked about it last time. One of the other names for it is the anterior association area. So it's going to interact with and, in part, control both the amygdala and the striatum, which, again, is part of the basal ganglia. So all sensory information related to emotion is going to travel into the brain through the amygdala. And so the amygdala is especially important in emotions. Uh, it's critical for responding to perceived threats. So for example, if somebody's coming toward you with an angry facial expression, um, how you emotionally respond to that. So do you respond to that with fear or aggression? The amygdala is going to dictate that. So um, it also plays a role then in linking the conscious and unconscious aspect of emotions. So what ends up happening there as far as the amygdala goes is that it's going to get sensory information uh, from areas concerned with vision, hearing, and touch. And then it's going to generate responses that are relayed onward, largely by the hypothalamus uh, and other structures that are going to control our, our automatic physiological responses. So if we laugh or cry or experience any other emotion, it's because uh, other brain structures are responding to the instructions of the amygdala. So as an example, and this is my picture there in the lower right, um, let's pretend that you're you know, just out in the street, maybe you're in downtown Whitewater or something, um, 
and there's a loud bang of a car backfiring. If that happened, you would probably startle and be ready for fight or flight. So you're ready, you know, do I need to take off running? Do I need to, you know, do I need to battle somebody? Um, and so what happened there when you startled is that the brain um, was aware that the sound, um, and that was transmitted to the auditory thalamus. So that, again, the thalamus has a bunch of different centers to it, and so that, that initial sound information goes to the auditory thalamus. Uh, then that sound information gets relayed directly to the amygdala and then indirectly to the auditory cortex, which is where we're eventually going to be able to localize that sound. Um, the amygdala then, in response to that really loud bang, sent a fear message to the prefrontal cortex, so that part where you uh, have cognition, where you actually process things. And then, then the amygdala also sends a message to the hypothalamus, which initiates increased heart rate, breathing, pupil dilation, etc. So you're startled before you even realize it. Then your auditory cortex helps you localize the sound, and your prefrontal cortex reasons that it was a car backfiring, not something dangerous to you, and that the danger signals, or after that happens, the danger signals from the amygdala are tamped down and your heart rate and blood pressure return to normal. Now, one of the things that can happen is that these fear circuits can go awry, and the amygdala can become overreactive. For example, triggering emotional responses that are disproportionate to the threat, and this is what happens with anxiety disorders. Um, that also, um, those inappropriate responses also include the hippocampus, which is an important part of the brain for storing memories of people, places, and objects, but also important for recalling memories in response to environmental stimuli. So, for example, experiencing significant trauma is particularly damaging to the hippocampus, again, where we store our memories. And since it stores memories, people with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, can experience flashbacks, spontaneous re-experiencing of the event, and the need to avoid sensory experiences associated with that event and more. Um, so, yeah, so I think I pretty well covered all the stuff on that slide. Um, let me make sure, I don't have anything else on the notes that I wanted to touch on here. Let's see. Uh, the only other thing I would, I would mention um, is that the frontal cortex uh, or prefrontal cortex can exert some control again over those, those fear messages. And so there's some interaction between them. So, um, for example, we can react emotionally to things that we know cognitively. So, um, for example, if you know, you're playing in a game and your team wins, then you know you won, and then that produces the emotion of happiness. So there's, there's some interaction between them where the, the prefrontal cortex can really control the amygdala, but sometimes um, that control can kind of um, not be implemented correctly, I guess. And so then that's when you can get some of those different disorders from um, anxiety disorders to PTSD. All right, so another system that's going to involve multiple brain structures is, is language. So language is, to no, no one's great surprise here, language is fairly complicated. So language is going to involve practically all of the association areas of the left side of the brain, including Broca's area, which is in the frontal lobe, and Wernicke's area, which spans the parietal and temporal lobes, and the auditory association area of the temporal lobe, and more beyond that. So in the early 1860s, a French physician named Paul Pierre Broca pictured here. Uh, and you don't really need to see his picture, but the reason this picture is on there is because of those fantastic mutton chops. So that's Paul, uh, Pierre Paul Broca. And in the 1860s, he noticed that one of his patients uh, who suffered from syphilis had a peculiar language deficit. And specifically, the patient could understand language perfectly well. He could follow instructions to the letter, but when he tried to speak, it was only unintelligible mumbles. So his vocal cords are fine. He could hum a tune, but he couldn't express himself either verbally or in writing. And so while or shortly after being under Broca's care, that patient died. And so Broca examined the patient's brain after he died and found damage to a part of the frontal cortex in the left hemisphere. And he was able to find, because antibiotics weren't invented for almost another 100 years, eight more patients with similar symptoms. Uh, and he found brain lesions in the same area in each of those eight patients, and so that area became known as Broca's area. So again, Broca's area is where we produce speech, is kind of the shorthand that we used last time. Carl Wernicke, who I don't have a picture of, but I can only assume he also had some fantastic chops, 
Uh, so he's a German physician, uh, and in 1875, he found a mirror image syndrome in one of his patients. So in Wernicke's patient, the patient could speak well and intelligibly, but couldn't understand language. So for example, when Wernicke instructed him to place object A on top of object B, the man had no idea what he was being asked to do. So pretty straightforward instructions, couldn't make heads or tails of it. So like Broca, Wernicke was able to identify a lesion in a specific area of the left hemisphere of the brain, which became known as Wernicke's area. And so the work of both of these scientists is really important because it led to the realization in the late 1800s, really in the 1870s, that mental functions could be related to specific brain structures. So there's one part of the brain that is responsible for this one thing. And, and so, again, because the brain stains didn't uh, come around until, I think, also the 1870s. I mentioned that on the, uh, two lectures ago, but I'm pretty sure that was the 1870s. Um, so the, the brain was kind of beyond really close study at this time. And so the fact that these two scientists were able to pinpoint, okay, uh, language is, or um, speaking is um, to some part, or to some extent, um, produced in this one area of the brain and understanding of languages in this other area of the brain, that was an important advance in the 1800s. So areas of speech and comprehension are in different parts of the brain, but they're connected by a pathway called the arcuate fasciculus. And so you can see the connection between the two areas here. So when we read, information is transmitted from our eyes to our visual cortex in the occipital lobe, while information that we hear is transmitted from our ears to the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. Information from the auditory and visual cortices is then transmitted to Wernicke's area, which then translates it to a neural code that understands the language. Once understood, the information passes to Broca's area so that we can verbally express ourselves in response. Damage to the arcuate fasciculus, so to that connection between the two, enables people to understand and express language, but the two areas of function operate completely independently. So information is going to come in, information goes out, but there's no connection between the two. So all of this stuff, again, is, is on the left side of the brain. So what is the right hemisphere doing here? What's the right side of the brain doing? So the corresponding areas of the right or non-dominant hemisphere are involved in interpreting body language or the, the nonverbal emotional components of language. So these, those areas on the right side help us interpret things like uh, inflection of their voice, facial expression, posture, etc. All right, so obviously memory is going to involve multiple structures as well. And so one of the things about memory is, is usually when we think about memory, we think about you know something that happened yesterday or last week or years ago. But memory is actually really important for our ability to, to function normally. And, and it's, I think, surprisingly so until someone loses theirs and then it becomes more obvious how important memory is. So it's easy to underappreciate the um, uh, importance of memory and our ability to function throughout the day. So for example, memory plays a role in satiety, which is the feeling of fullness. We typically think of hunger as being primarily physiological. So when our blood sugar drops, um, that would be a physiological cue that we need to eat. But in addition to those physiological cues, our eating is also affected by social cues, like time, you know, is it noon, five o'clock, whatever time you eat, or the fact that others are eating. So in studies of amnesiac patients, so patients who have amnesia, researchers would tell patients it was lunchtime and then feed them a full lunch. They would then clean up everything and leave the room, returning 10 minutes later, at which point they would tell the patient, who again has amnesia, that it was lunchtime and the patient would proceed to eat another meal. This persisted into the fourth meal when patients would generally stop eating because they felt full. So they're actually starting to get a physiological response from the stress receptors in the stomach. Maybe they're getting that CCK and making it back to the hypothalamus like we talked about a couple minutes ago. So um, in non-amnesiac patients, when, so people who have normal functioning memory, when presented with a second lunch, they would respond that they had just eaten, not that they weren't hungry, as their primary reason not to partake in a second meal. And similarly, if the dirty dishes from the first meal were left with the amnesiac patients, they would deduce that they had recently eaten and then decline to eat that second meal. So memory then plays a really important role in govern governing our behavior. So memories are stored in different regions throughout the brain. Um, and we talked about this some uh, in the, the first day when, when we talked about um, Penfield. So, and I'll retell you that story in case you forgot it. Um, so, for example, auditory memories are stored, at least in part, in the temporal lobe. And so remember, 
speaking of that, uh, we talked about the Canadian neurosurgeon uh, Wilder Penfield, who used electrical stimulation on the brains of epileptic patients in the 30s and 40s. And when he stimulated different areas throughout the cerebral cortex, um, he got different responses. So for example, when he stimulated the, the temporal lobe or passed an electrical current through the temporal lobe, just below the lateral sulcus, which is the auditory cortex, patients would report hearing songs from their childhood, including lullabies that their mothers had sung to them. The medial temporal lobe, which includes a structure called the hipp hippocampus, which as we've discussed is important for memory formation, um, and all, the hippocampus also plays a role in the consolidation of short-term into long-term memories. So for example, the hippocampus is one of the brain re regions damaged in Alzheimer's disease and presents as an inability to remember things that have recently happened. And so we talked about Alzheimer's disease and the, the uh, inability to remember things that have happened you know, that day or in recent memory or what should be recent memory um, as part of, part of the result of uh, plaque accumulation and then neurofibrillary tangle accumulation. So there are two major memory systems. The first one is explicit or declarative memory. And so explicit or declarative memory allows us to consciously remember people, places, and objects. So for example, when I remember your name, hometown, or basic biographical information uh, for you after having talked to you in one of our little, uh, one of the, the bonus meetings, um, that is, I am using then my explicit or declarative memory. Implicit or non-declarative memory is when, uh, or is what the brain uses for motor and perceptual skills. So it's the things that we do automatically. So putting on your seatbelt when you get in the car, riding a bike, driving, etc. Those are implicit things. So those are kind of just motor programs, that things that, again, that we do automatically. So memories are physically formed in the brain through synaptic connections between neurons. If neuron A stimulates neuron B, a change will take place in one or both of those cells. And if that change, if that happens repeatedly, if neuron A stimulates neuron B repeatedly, the synaptic connections between those cells are strengthened. And so one of the ways that that happens is neuron A that's sending the signal, that presynaptic terminal, it's going to get, uh, end up with a little bit, more, little bit more calcium in that presynaptic terminal. And so that makes it easier for it to release its neurotransmitter. So it sort of, it facilitates uh, the connection between the two, it makes it easier to, for it to, to signal to neuron B hey, you need to depolarize. Um, so that seems to be what happens with the formation of explicit memory in the hippocampus, is that repeated firing between the two. So short-term memory, which can be stored for minutes or hours, seems to be the result of that temporary strengthening of those existing synaptic connections. So you're facilitating neuron A, stimulating neuron B. But long-term memory is a little bit different. So long-term memory is, is information that is stored for days, weeks, or years, and that seems to be the result of the growth of new, uh, new synapses. And so that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, why astrocytes are so important is because they help facilitate that rewiring of the brain. So long-term memory then leads to anatomical changes in the brain, whereas short-term memory does not. So there's some interesting differences between explicit and implicit memory. So even if explicit memory is damaged, we can still learn new things, we're just not consciously aware of them, which seems counterintuitive, but it's possible. So for example, one of the most important patients in the, hist uh, in the history of psychology um, was a guy named Henry Molaison. So he's known in the medical literature by his initials HM, and that's him pictured there on the right. So he was run over by a bicycle when he was nine and suffered a serious head injury. The injury led to epilepsy and he began to have regular large seizures such that he was unable to hold down a job or drive despite the fact that he was quite intelligent. Medications were not very helpful and so at the age of 27, which is in 1953, a neurosurgeon agreed to try a radical surgery and remove part of his brain to see if that would help. The surgeon removed part of the medial temporal lobe, including the hippocampus, on both sides of HM's brain. The operation was a success in that it essentially cured the seizures, but unfortunately, it left HM unable to form new memories. He could only retain information for about 30 seconds. After the operation, he remembered people he had known prior to the surgery, but couldn't remember anyone he had met after the surgery. He couldn't learn how to get to the bathroom at the hospital. Doctors assumed that uh, his memory deficit would apply to all areas of knowledge, that he wouldn't be able to learn anything new because he couldn't remember things for more than 30 seconds. But to test that assumption, 
they asked him to trace a drawing of a star while looking at his hand and the paper in a mirror. Let me see if I can get this to advance. I'll show you what the star test looks like. There it is. Okay. Uh, everybody has difficulty performing this task the first day, but by day three, most people can do it almost perfectly. If HM's memory deficits applied to all new things, he shouldn't be able to improve. But by day three, however, his drawings looked just like everybody else's, even though he had no memory of ever having performed the task before, but he was still better at it by the third day. And similarly, in the early 1990s, a San Diego man, whose name was Eugene Pauly, also known by his initials EP in the medical literature, suffered a severe bout of viral meningitis. The virus essentially destroyed the medial temporal lobe of EP's brain, including the hippocampus, but left everything else largely intact. Like HM, EP couldn't make new memories. His brain was essentially frozen in time before the meningitis, but there were some types of things that he could learn. After the meningitis, E.P., who was in his early 70s at the time, moved with his wife to a new home. And when they got there, his wife walked him through routines repeatedly. If he said he needed to use the restroom, she would walk him there because he couldn't remember where it was. Similarly, when he was hungry, she would take him into the kitchen. Once he was there, however, he recognized things like the refrigerator and the stove. He just couldn't remember how to get to that room. In addition, his wife Beverly would take him uh, on walks around their neighborhood twice daily, always following the same route. After a few months at their new place, Eugene disappeared one day. Beverly panicked and went looking for him, finally returning home to call the police, and found Eugene on the couch watching TV with a few pine cones on the table in front of him. He always picked up pine cones on their walks, so cl clearly he must have gone for a walk on his own, but he had no memory of leaving or being on the walk. Similarly, when a researcher visited their home and asked Eugene to draw a map of it, he couldn't do it. But in a later conversation, he got up and used the restroom, washed his hands, and returned to the living room without a problem. So how can a man who can't map his house or neighborhood navigate both? Implicit memory, unlike explicit memory, apparently isn't stored in the hippocampus. It's stored in the amygdala, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and in simple reflex patterns. So even if we can't remember how we know them, we can perform new motor tasks, which is what he was doing when he was walking around the neighborhood around his house. EP performed a similar test to the one HM did, the star test that's on the slide, and was astounded by how good he was later in the trials because he couldn't remember that he'd been doing the exercise for weeks. The basal ganglia, the same region of the brain involved in Parkinson's disease, appears to serve somewhat as the brain's autopilot. So for example, it allows you to do very familiar things without really thinking about them. It allows your mind to wander while you tie your shoes or drive or brush your teeth or other routine tasks. Essentially, the autopilot function serves to save energy. When you're performing routine tasks, it allows you to filter out the extraneous information and just group or chunk what's important. So people whose basal ganglia are damaged lose the ability to ignore insignificant things. They take, uh, take note too much of what's going on and can become mentally paralyzed. So they can't you know, filter out that extraneous information. Everything becomes important if you have damaged basal ganglia. So for example, one study showed that people with damage to their basal ganglia couldn't associate facial expressions with feelings, like fear or anger, because they were perpetually uncertain of which part of the face to look at. They didn't know whether they needed to look at the eyes, the mouth, etc. In a series of studies at MIT in the 1990s, researchers looked at, at the brain activity of mice in a simple T-shaped maze with chocolate on one side. So there's a picture of what the maze looked like. A little off kilter because I had to take a picture with my phone, but that's what it looked like. Um, so the mice started behind a door, and then there was a loud click, and the door opened. Initially, there was an explosion of neuronal activity. So you can see this is initially what happened. So there's the click, the, the mouse's brain is just going like crazy. Um, the mice sniffed, listened, watched, and physically explored their surroundings until they found the chocolate. The mice ran the same maze with the same click and the chocolate in the same place for several days. As the pattern stayed the same, the mice ran to the chocolate faster and faster, but the researchers also noticed a steep drop-off in brain activity. Their basal ganglia took over. They basically switched over to being on autopilot. They heard the click when they were behind the door, and they were like, oh, I know what happens next. Chocolate's over there. And so they can basically shut off or use less energy um, as they go through that. So the basal ganglia there is in control. So running the maze became a habit, something the mice could do without consciously having to think about it. 
just like long-term explicit memories are made by new synapses in the medial temporal lobe, new implicit memories are made by new synapses in neurons that run through the basal ganglia. So a habit then is something that we do not that we do unconsciously, and it can become physically hardwired into the brain. So um, we see this, you know, uh, maybe every day when you get home, you eat a snack or something like that, right? And so that that's sort of this habit, this routine that you've started. And so you started the routine. There was some reason, probably at one point you were hungry, uh, and then it just became a thing that you do. And so some of those habits, um, you know, maybe smoking every time you leave the house or I don't know, something, right? Um, but those things then can become hardwired into the brain through the basal ganglia. You've got new synapses that weren't there before, and so those can drive that habit behavior. And so there's my little picture of there's some kind of a cue, then I do the routine, and I get whatever the reward is, uh, and then we just keep going round and round. All right, so let's talk now about concussions. So um, what happens in a concussion? So there's two major sets of forces that cause them. Um, the first set or the first major set of forces is acceleration, deceleration. So the head either speeds up or slows down. Uh, and then the second set is rotational. So the poor chargers receiver here is kind of getting a combination of both. His head is probably being slowed down. There's some combination of deceleration plus a rotational mechanism. And the mechanism doesn't matter a ton because both sets of mechanisms, whether it's acceleration, uh, deceleration, or rotational, end up um, stretching neurons in the brain. So basically, if you um, if the brain goes from being in a constant state of motion while you're running, or if the brain goes from being still to being sped up really quickly, that's going to cause some mechanical deformation of the brain. It's going to, um, you know, compress on itself, or it's going to stretch, or whatever. And any of those things then can cause the axons of neurons to be pulled apart. Not completely apart, but they can be stretched, is a better way of saying that. And so when that happens, when the axon of a neuron is stretched, that neuron can't perform its job like it's supposed to. So, for example, you see this in the peripheral nervous system. If you've ever had, um, they're colloquially known as either stingers or burners. And typically what happens there is your head gets knocked to one side and your shoulder gets kind of pushed down. So you see it, it's more of a, it's a, typically a contact sport injury. So like football, a lot of the time somebody makes a tackle and their head gets knocked to one side. And so what ends up happening there, the symptoms that the patient reports or that the athlete reports is that they've got burning or tingling or numbness in one of their arms. Typically it's on the stretch side. So if your head gets knocked to the left, on the right side is where you're going to experience those symptoms. And so what has happened there is you've actually stretched out the nerves of the brachial plexus, which is the group of, of nerves that innervate your arm. And so because you've stretched out those nerves, they're not functioning correctly. All right, so they're firing when they shouldn't be or they're not firing at all when they should be. And the brain interprets that as burning or stinging, or it doesn't get any information at all, which then becomes numbness, right? And so that's, that's a dysfunction in the peripheral nervous system. In the case of a concussion, we're talking about a very similar process of either uh, stretching or compressing the axons in the central nervous system, in the brain specifically. And so that's going to produce a similar kind of firing when there shouldn't be or not firing when there should be, and then that produces the symptoms that we associate with concussion. And so basically what happens is kind of this cascade of things. So when you stretch a neuron, you're going to get uh, a spike in glutamate levels. Remember that glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's, it's what, what's released from one neuron to the next that's going to cause um, excitation, going to cause depolarization and potentially an action potential in that second neuron. So when, the, when neuron A is damaged, uh, it's not able to hang on to its glutamate like it should have, and so it's going to just dump a bunch of its glutamate from its axon terminals. And then that's going to stimulate the neurons around it. But um, one of the things that it does is, is remember that that receipt of glutamate also for, allows for calcium influx into neuron B, the receiving neuron. And so that calcium moving into the receiving neuron, as we talked about with Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease and with alcoholism, that accumulation of calcium in that neuron can lead to damage of the cell skeleton particularly if it's, it's, if it's along the axon. So in addition to that, when we stretch a neuron, we essentially um, damage the sodium and potassium channels, especially the potassium channels, and so that axon is going to leach a bunch of potassium from it. 
So then that throws off the gradients. So remember, we talked a couple times ago about uh, the way that neurons send action potentials is based on an electrochemical gradient. They start at resting membrane potential with a bunch of sodium outside, a bunch of potassium inside. If they allow a bunch of potassium to leach out, well, then that throws off that gradient and it actually makes the inside of the cell extra negative, right? So it hyperpolarizes the cell and it inhibits that cell. I mentioned a minute ago, calcium entering the neurons, which is probably due to the spike in glutamate levels. Um, and so the brain then starts to work overtime because it's gonna try to run its sodium potassium pump. So it's gonna try to pump potassium back into the neuron. It's gonna try to pump sodium back out. It's gonna try to pump calcium out. But one of the things that ends up happening is with a concussion that that flux in calcium moving from the extracellular space to the intracellular space actually um, alters the ability of the astrocytes to control circulation. And so those damaged neurons are gonna need to use a lot of energy to use a lot of ATP, but they need oxygen to make it. And so they're gonna run through their ATP supply, but because of that calcium flux, we can't supply enough blood to those damaged neurons. And so what's happening when the brain's, when I'm saying the brain's working overtime, that's when we're running those pumps, trying to bring potassium back in, trying to kick calcium out, trying to kick sodium out. And then we run through all the ATP and then we are out of our energy, can't make more because we're not getting enough oxygen. And so then the brain activity decreases. So because the neurons don't have enough ATP to keep running those pumps, their activity is going to decrease. And so then that's what's gonna produce some of those symptoms that we commonly associate with concussion, particularly the fatigue. So as you get less uh, blood supply to those neurons, then that's gonna be one of the primary things that's gonna produce that fatigue sensation. So typical symptoms that we associate with a concussion or signs and symptoms. Symptoms are something that the patient reports. Signs are something that I, as the clinician, can see. So like your, your or I can measure it. Um, so your, your temperature, if you have a fever, that's a sign of an injury or a sign of a, an infection in that case, because I can actually measure that as opposed to pain is something that only they can describe and I can't, active, I can't measure it in the same way that I can measure things like uh, temperature or limb girth or those kinds of things. So those are symptoms. So at any rate, uh, so the typical signs and symptoms of concussion. So you got headache, you got confusion, which is again, kind of like fatigue, that's gonna be related to that, um, that lack of blood flow and uh, lack of activity on the part of the neurons. So in that case, that's primarily in that prefrontal cortex. Other things that you get, so you get amnesia, so they can't remember. So there's two types of amnesia, anterograde and retrograde. Retrograde amnesia is they can't remember what happened before the accident. So if you ask them, what'd you have for breakfast? And they don't know, that's retrograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia is they can't remember what happened after the accident. And so if you've ever uh, given or seen or taken your own concussion evaluation, one of the, the common parts of those evaluations is the uh, patient will be asked to remember a series of words. And so it'll be like three unrelated words, dog, red, sandy, or something like that. Um, and so what you'll do is do, you'll say, okay, here's three words. I want you to remember them, say them back to me, and then uh, continue your evaluation. What are those three words again? Do some more stuff. What are those three words again? And so you're assessing for anterior grade amnesia. One of the things when people have anterior grade amnesia, oftentimes it's, it's, um, somewhat apparent anyway, because they ask you the same questions over and over and over again. So for example, um, at my previous institution, um, we had a, um, one of our IT guys, actually, they were playing noon basketball. And so um, he went up for a layup and somebody somehow hit his legs and, and he uh, lost his balance and he landed on his back and he hit the back of his head on the court. And so he had a concussion. Um, and in particular, he had anterior grade amnesia where he kept asking me um, if he scored. So he'd be like, oh, you know, did I, did I score on that layup? And I'd say, yeah, you score, okay. And then a couple minutes later, he'd be like, ah, oh, man, did I score on that? And so, you know, they, they just keep asking you the same things over and over. That's, that's usually, that's the easiest way to pick up anterior grade amnesia. But, but the more um, intentional way is that you give them things to remember. So in terms of CTE, so again, that's chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so um, in some ways it is similar to what we talked about with Alzheimer's where you're gonna get some of those um, tangles of tau proteins. And so I mentioned last time or, or when we talked about Alzheimer's disease a couple times ago. So here's, here's kind of your generic neuron, right? And so here's its axon. 
And so remember, we, we've talked about the cell skeleton. And so what this effectively is, is the cell skeleton. Remember way back, or not way back, a couple times ago on, on the polio slide, I talked about axonal transport, ant anterograde and retrograde, moving things um, down the axon or up the axon. So these proteins are responsible for doing that. But when we pull the neuron apart, so if you get you know, a, an acceleration uh, type of an injury, for example, or a rotational type of an injury, that's going to put a, a tensile stress on the neuron, it's going to pull it apart. And so that'll cause some of these little tau proteins that help embed this, the cell skeleton or help attach, the, uh, help attach this to the membrane of the cell. That's going to cause some of them to kind of float free. And so when they're floating free inside of the axon, they tend to clump together. And so that's when you get those uh, tangles, the tangles of tau proteins. And so if a bunch of those tangles accumulate together inside of the axon, the result is that that neuron can't transport things up or down, and that tends to result in the death of the neuron. And so when you get a bunch of areas with the, those tau proteins accumulating in tangles like that, you can stain for it in the brain. And so then you're going to get um, those really dark brown areas are where you've got lots of tangles of tau proteins. And so you can see it up here uh, in the cortex up here, and then also in the, the hippocampus and the memory section down here. So depending upon where the person has the tau accumulation is determine the, the symptoms that we associate with CTE. So somebody who has more uh, damage in the uh, prefrontal cortex is going to have problems with impulse control, problems with their relationship with other people, maybe they become irrationally angry, those kinds of things. Um, and then you're also going to see some memory deficits because oftentimes the hippocampus is damaged as well. So in terms of CTE, so that's, you know, obviously concussions are one of the big things in sports and really have been since the mid-2000s when it was first diagnosed in a retired football player. And so um, you're, you see stuff about concussions all the time, and, and athletes are, are rightly um, but very concerned about them. And so um, one of the things about CTE, though, is that it's not necessarily the number of concussions. Really what a concussion is, is it means that I, as a clinician, as an athletic trainer, or somebody who's a physician or a PT or, or whatever, um, EMT, can observe the signs of injury in you. So for example, your confusion, your amnesia, et cetera. Um, that's, that's a concussion, something that, that you have clinical signs and symptoms that we can observe. So um, you can get damage to some of those neurons without ever having had a concussion. So one of the better predictors or, uh, yeah, let's go with that. One of the better predictors of development of CTE is actually the number of head impacts an indiv individual has taken. And so there are some studies. So CTE was first discovered or first uh, discussed in boxers in the 1920s. It was originally in, in the medical literature referred to as punch drunk syndrome uh, in 1928. Um, and in doing that, um, so, so that doctor talked about pinpoint lesions, but... Um, when, when they were discussing in the medical literature, some of the, some of the um, studies after 1928 looked at the relationship between the number of times an athlete, a boxer, had been knocked out versus how many rounds they'd fought. And actually, rounds total was a better predictor of whether or not somebody developed the symptoms of CTE than the number of times they'd actually been knocked out. All right, so last couple things here. So the meninges, so um, those are your layers of protection for the brain. So there are three meninges starting superficial work into deep. So the first one on there is the dura mater. So that's the strongest of them. So again, these are these are coverings of the brain is a way to think about them. So the dura mater, dura mater is the strongest of them. It has two layers, the periosteal layer, which is essentially um, a layer that connects to the inner surface of the skull. And then you've got the meningeal layer, which is the true external covering of the brain. Then deep to that, you've got the arachnoid mater. So if we go down here, so here's a little arachnoid mater, okay? Um, and so the arachnoid mater is, is named for these loose fibers here that kind of look like a spider web. Um, and so there's a lot of space under there. Um, and so in that subarachnoid space is where we tend to have a lot of blood vessels. So it's a pretty loose brain covering um, with lots of blood vessels, but at the same time, because the arachnoid mater is pretty fine and elastic, fairly stretchy. The vessels are, are fairly poorly protected. And then the last one, the deepest one, is the pia mater. And so you can see the pia mater down here. 
Um, and so that one is really delicate, relatively thin connective tissue that's going to cling closely to the brain. And it's also going to have a bunch of really tiny blood vessels that, that directly feed the brain. So I have a quick case study for you. So the case study is that um, you're a football coach or something to that effect, or you're on the sideline. And so one of your players um, got hit. So we'll, you know, your guy is the Saints guy. <laughs> got hit um, helmet to helmet, and the player briefly lost consciousness on the field. Now his loss of consciousness, or him being knocked out, lasted for less than a minute, and he came back too. And since he became lucid again, um, or since he came back too, he's, he's been pretty lucid, he's been pretty with it. So he doesn't seem to have amnesia. He has a little bit of confusion, but not much. Um, in the locker room after the game, though, you notice that he appears to be kind of out of it. So he's slow to respond to your questions. Um, he tells you that he has a severe headache, and you notice that he is increasingly confused and tired, and then he vomits. So the question is, what could be going on? And the answer is, he has an intracranial bleed. He has a brain bleed. So, uh, and if you took him to get a CT scan, so obviously this is the front of the skull, this is the back. Um, so this is the accumulation of blood inside of the brain. So whenever you get bleeding inside of the brain, that blood starts to accumulate. It's going to try to push out, but of course it can't because of the skull. And so then it pushes down on the softest thing, which is your brain. So the blood accumulates, starts to press down on your brain, which then affects brain function. Um, so there are a couple types that are commonly observed. So an epidural hematoma is an arterial tear. Usually it is the middle meningeal artery. And so in the case of an epidural hematoma, blood is going to accumulate between the dura mater and the skull. And so then as it accumulates, you get a progressive loss of function and consciousness. So they start out with it, and then they kind of go downhill from there, which is the scenario that I gave you where the athlete was knocked out. That's kind of the classic presentation of an epidural hematoma is loss of consciousness. They seem pretty with it, and then they start to go downhill fairly quickly within a couple of hours, you know, less and less aware of what's going on, increasingly confused, increasingly tired. Um, you know, they're just feeling worse and worse after the injury. That's the, the common presentation of an epidural hematoma. Um, eventually, it'll lead to, if you just kind of let it go, it eventually leads to loss of consciousness and seizures as the blood accumulates. So, accounts for very few head injuries epidural hematomas do they're they're relatively uncommon probably certainly less than five percent of head injuries but probably more than more like one to two percent of head injuries um, but they obviously can be fatal if you don't pick up that they they've suffered that injury um, one of the good things about epidural hematomas is because it's an arterial bleed it tends to become symptomatic fairly quickly, so within a few hours. So epidural hematomas with the arterial bleed, I guess a good thing is they, uh, the fatality rate is relatively low because, again, people become symptomatic fairly quickly, um, and so they get treatment fairly quickly. As opposed to subdural hematomas can technically be either arterial bleeds or venous bleeds, um, and venous bleeds are actually the more dangerous of the two. Um, so subdural hematomas are seen in somewhere between 10 to 20% of traumatic brain injury cases. And in this case, I'm not referring specifically to sporting traumatic brain injuries. That's going to include things like auto accidents. Um, so you see subdural hematomas in somewhere between 10 and 20% of all traumatic brain injuries. But subdural hematomas are, uh, account for about 30% of the deaths related to traumatic brain injuries. Because what ends up happening is you get a, a venous bleed, and so the arterial system is that high pressure side of the system where you take, you know, when you check your pulse, you're putting your finger over an artery. So you've got high pressure, rapid flow. On the venous side, that's where they, uh, if you go and, and give blood, they're going to put the, the needle into a vein. And if you've ever watched, the blood just kind of oozes out. So there's a much slower bleeding on the venous side. It's a low pressure system. Um, and so if you've got a tear of a vein inside of your skull, you're going to get blood just kind of oozing into the skull. And so what ends up happening then is that it takes several hours for the um, symptoms to become manifest. So for example, if you've ever taken somebody to the hospital after they had a head injury and you were instructed to wake them up several times throughout the course of the night, the reason that you were doing that you didn't know it, but the reason that you were doing that is that you're checking for a subdural hematoma. You're making sure that you can still wake them up, that they don't have a brain bleed. 
Um, so that's that's the rationale for that recommendation. So you're just you're you know continuing to check on them because again the, they may not become symptomatic for you know eight hours or more after the initial injury. And so that's that's why subdural hematomas tend to be more deadly than epidural as the, the symptoms present much later. Two more slides. Cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, so that's the fluid that the brain floats in. Um, it has a few functions. The first is to provide buoyancy to the brain. The brain kind of, like I said, floats in it. Um, and so that's going to reduce the weight of the brain pretty significantly. Um, if the brain wasn't floating in fluid, it, it could be crushed under its own weight. And so it just, uh, obviously, that's not uh, going to allow for normal brain function. So it has to float in fluid. Um, so it protects the brain from mechanical insults. So obviously, if you've got this uh, layer of fluid here, then whenever the skull stops, you've got some space before the brain actually strikes the skull. So oftentimes, um, if I ask in class, like what happens in a concussion, oftentimes students will say, well, you, you know, you hit your head on something and your brain smacks your skull, which can happen sometimes, but for the most part actually doesn't um, because of this CSF. So your brain usually doesn't, unless it's a really um, high velocity force, the brain usually doesn't actually make contact with the skull. You just get that, that stretching of the axons that I talked about earlier, or compression of the axons. Um, so helps protect the brain, keeps it from making contact with the skull, and then helps nourish the brain. For the most part, it actually uh, carries waste products away from the brain. And then the last thing is the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier, its main job is to maintain a stable environment from the brain, to protect it from um, variations in chemicals. So like, um, you know, during or after exercise, you'd get potentially a drop in amino acids, uh, drop in blood glucose, um, increases or decreases in hormones. And so those things then could cause firing of the neurons when we would prefer that that not happen, and that would be problematic. And so the blood-brain barrier then allows only a few things to cross into the brain and so helps protect the neurons. Um, so there's three components to it. The first is a continuous endothelium. What is that? So this is that astrocyte picture that you've seen before. So here's, you know, again, here's your neuron. Here's your capillary. Uh, and so the endothelium is the inner layer of a blood vessel. And so in um, different types of blood vessels, so like in the kidneys, for example, because the kidneys are involved in filtration of the blood, um, you're going to have bigger gaps in the endothelium um, versus inside of the brain. Basically, those cells are really tightly connected to each other. So there's not things can't sneak between the cells that line the inside of the blood vessel. So that's what a con continuous endothelium means. Thick basal lamina is the layer of con connective tissue around the blood vessel. So it's just it's simply thicker than it is in other areas, which helps, um, you know, provides a, a physical barrier, makes it harder for things to diffuse from the blood vessel outside of it. And then you've got the feet of the astrocytes here. And so that's essentially just one more layer that something would have to diffuse through. And so between the three, between the continuous endothelium where things can't slip between the cells, a thick layer of connective tissue around the blood vessel, you know, again, farther physical distance, and then we make it even farther with the feet of the astrocytes, that really limits the things that can make it from the bloodstream and into the brain. So it keeps things like metabolic waste products, uh, pro certain proteins, toxins, most drugs, um, and potassium are kept out. Um, but other things that uh, are fat soluble can actually pass through the barrier, including nicotine, alcohol, and anesthetics. And that is that. So thanks for making it through the brain. Um, we'll do a review for the test on Friday of this week, and then the uh, second exam will be on Monday of next week. So we'll see you then.